I grew up in Miami, Florida, a true Floridian, actually born and raised in Miami, Florida. And up through ninth grade, my schools were segregated. Even though it's not all that long ago, schools didn't integrate until my 10th grade year. Then in 10th grade, transferred over to Coral Gables High School in the Gables, in Coral Gables, Florida, and graduated from Coral Gables. Uh, went to Florida State University up in Tallahassee, go nose, and uh, finished Florida State University and then began my Navy career. And I entered Aviation Officer Candidate School in May of 73. And at that time, now the Vietnam War was still going on. So I was volunteering for military service at the time when many people were attempting to avoid military service. But I knew it was the right thing for me. My first plane was what called, the Navy called a T-34, a single engine propeller driven airplane with a two seats so the flight instructor could sit in the rear seat and the flight student could sit up front. That's the first airplane that I trained on. I left that and went to the T-28 Trojan. Helicopters are probably the world's most difficult aircraft to fly. They're a real challenge to learn. I was selected to go to basic helicopter training. My first assignment was a helicopter squadron out in San Diego. It was an anti-submarine warfare squadron. We flew what's called the SH-2, that's the designation of the helicopter, but it was a big 12,000 uh, pound combat rig helicopter. It had a full sensor suite that could be used to detect, localize, track, and actually attack submarines. We carried torpedoes w for the, uh, the weapons, and we flew off of destroyers. So I've landed a helicopter on the back of a destroyer I remember the very first time I was in the SH-2 and we were attempting to land on the destroyer. The helicopter commander was in the right seat. That's where the helicopter commander sits in the right seat instead of the left seat like a fixed wing airplane. I was in the left seat and then we had the sensor operator in the, in the rear. We were, perform we were doing exercises. It was the early in the morning, old dark 30 as we like to say, at foggy. We took off from the destroyer and as we climbed out, we would notice the auxiliary fuel tanks were not transferring. And that's something we wanted to get checked out. So we were gonna turn back around, do an instrument approach back to the, to the destroyer and land and get that checked out. Well, on final, again, it's night, it's dark, it's foggy. All you can see is the square from the, from the destroyer. We inadvertently got into too high a sink rate and actually bounced the helicopter off the surface of the water. We were lucky to get out of the water and that we didn't crash and burn. Tore a hole in the back of it, scooped water up, threw water up front. We got wet inside, but we managed to get it back in the air. And, and when our heart rates uh, calmed down just a little bit, came back around again and did a successful landing on board the ship. So you talk about some hairy operations. There's nothing uh, more challenging for a pilot than U.S. Navy operations, either fixed wing or rotary wing, when you're operating off a ship at sea. Following that tour of duty, I was selected to attend Naval Postgraduate School to finish my degree in engineering, in aeronautical engineering with avionics. And at that point, I was selected for jet training uh, to go into my fighter squadron. Well, when I finished my A-4 training, or my jet transition as we call it, I was sent to uh, VF-101, which is the Fleet Replacement Squadron, to learn to fly the F-14 Tomcat. So I spent a year in there, and that's, that's about right, and then reported to VF-84. VF means V is fixed wing, F is fighter. So I was fixed wing fighter squadron 84, the Jolly Rogers. The, the insignia was the skull and crossbones. Following that tour of duty, I applied to and was accepted to aerospace engineering duty officer. I was a production test pilot on the A-7 aircraft while we were standing up facilities to handle the Navy's F-18. The airplanes there at the uh, facility had been completely torn apart, reworked, put back together again, and then my job was to go up and test them and to determine if they worked properly. And uh, some of the flights were very, very interesting because as you can guess, everything didn't work uh, completely as it was designed to work. I can remember another interesting instance on an A7. The runway at Jacksonville had been partially closed, so I could take off normally, but every landing had to be an arrested landing, okay? And as a result, when I tested this airplane, I never did test the brakes because every landing was with the tail hook across the runway. Okay, 
The jet passes, it's ready to be delivered to its squadron at Cecil Field, next door to, to NAS Jacksonville. I take off, I fly around, and I'm getting ready to land at Cecil Field. It's dark, the runway is wet, the brakes have never been tested. So I come in and I land the A7 on the runway and I touch the brakes, no brakes. And the first thing through my mind was the emergency brake. Well, a problem with the emergency brake is that it's not gradual. It's either, either full on or full off. So I touched the little bit and I felt the brakes grab. I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'll blow both tires. At the same time, the end of the runway is approaching because I'm screaming down the runway. Then the next thing hit me was, uh, was turn the anti-skid off. I turned the anti-skid off. I had brakes, but now it's too late. There's no way I'm gonna stop this jet. Then I'm thinking in the back of my mind, the tail hook. I slap the tail hook down, the arresting wire is coming, and, and pull the, the nose up just enough, and thank goodness, I caught the arresting wire. You just sit there for a moment because the adrenaline's pumping, your legs are shaking, and it, <laughs> your heart rate is up, and you just say, oh, thank you, I did. <laughs> so the, the decision-making process is one that really gets compressed when these things happen. When they happen, they happen just like that. Well, after three years there at Jacksonville, I was sent to the, the Naval Air Development Center at Warminster, Pennsylvania. And my job was the Deputy Director of the Tactical Aircraft Systems Department and also Research and Development Testing Evaluation Pilot. The Naval Air Development Center was where I was located when I applied for astronaut uh, training and fortunately I was selected. So in July of uh, 92, I reported to Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas as part of the class number 14 of astronaut candidates uh, to be selected for the space shuttle program. I think going into NASA was always in the back of my mind. It was always something that I was interested in doing. And uh, over the years, it, it, the, the thought came and went. And uh, I wanted to go to NASA because it was a nice step up from what I was already doing in the Navy, a nice new challenge. And uh, it was also a way that I could contribute because the things that we learn in space benefit everybody on Earth. So you're really making a contribution to society as an astronaut. At least that's the way I view it.